discussion on module four that deals with protein isolation and characterization, we'll be, we will be looking at some other biophysical methods that are commonly used for structure analysis, mostly for molecular weight determination and other methods by which we can characterize the protein. Now, in the discussion for this class, we will be looking at the specific aspects of lyophilization, electrophoresis, isoelectric focusing, a bit about microscopy and other AFM techniques, which are important in understanding the protein as a whole and the protein in the form of aggregates, something that we will be studying later on as well. As we look at the specific keywords, we will see, we will revisit the concept of isoelectric point as well. When we talk about lyophilization, the idea here is that when we isolate the protein, we know that we have our protein from the different peaks that we learned in our chromatography class, that there are the proteins in, dissolved in the buffer solution. Now, the idea here in lyophilization is to remove the water or the excess ions that we have present in the solution and retrieve the protein of interest. Now, the conventional method of dehydration uses evaporation. The evaporation technique, which is something that we cannot use for any heat, sens heat sensitive sample, such as proteins. So, in this case, the concept is that we use low temperature dehydration. So that involves a reduction of the pressure, which essentially reduces the boiling point of water. And then we can remove the water at this low boiling point. For example, when we look at a specific phase diagram, we look at a liquid water, solid liquid water phase diagram, where we know that if we are within this range along the blue line, we can go from sublimation from the solid phase to the vapor phase, considering that our pressure and temperature are within this range. So if we isolate or if we can reduce the pressure to a level that would be within this range, then we can reduce the boiling point of water and we would go to a sublimation process taking us directly to the vapor state. So the lyophilization process involves the removal of water from the protein solution by sublimation under vacuum at a reduced pressure. And using lyophilization, the protein can preserve its biological activity, usually fully, but sometimes there is partial loss due to the reduction of the water that is present. Because of these stress-involved damages, the structural integrity of the protein where we are vaporizing the water that is present. That is a very common technique used. Another very common technique used is electrophoresis where we are looking at the movement of molecules and an electric field. This is extensively used to determine the molecular weight of proteins, and we will see how this is achieved. Most biomacromolecules are charged, and because of their charge, they will move in an electric field if they are subjected to an electric field. For example, nucleic acids are strong polyacids. We have proteins that are polyampholytes. We know that each protein has a isoelectric point. This isoelectric point and the pH of the buffer will determine the charge on the protein. And this is going to be a very important aspect of our understanding, as we saw in ion exchange chromatography, where the pH of our eluting buffer would depend upon the isolation or the characterization, as we will see, of the protein. So because of these charges, we will have the biomacromolecule move in the electric field. So we have an electric field and we have two opposing forces here. One is the movement due to the electrostatic force. The other is due to the frictional force 
and a retardation force that is there because of the buffer or because of the fluid in which, in this case, which is going to be a gel network. So that re retards the motion of the bi biological macromolecule, but the electrostatic force will pull it into a specific direction. And it is the balance of these forces that is important in electrophoresis. So what happens is we have a steady motion. And this steady motion is given by the product of the frictional coefficient and the velocity and the external electric field, the electronic charge, and the balance. This electrophoric mobility is important in telling us how the molecule is going to move when it is subjected to this electric field. In a typical experiment, we have sodium dodecyl sulfate treated samples that are loaded into the wells. What sodium dodecyl sulfate does is it renders the molecules negatively charged. So all the protein molecules become negatively charged as a result of which they all move towards the positive electrode. Now the movement towards the positive electrode through the gel network is therefore going to be according to their size. Because all of them have a rendered negative charge, all of them will move to the positive electrode and we would have decreasing molecular weight in this direction because the larger molecules would have more retardation and would be sluggish in their movement towards the positive electron. So we have a certain distance that is going to be moved at the end of the experiment. And we have at the end a tracking die that is has a very low molecular weight that reaches, say, at the end of the gel. And then anything relative to its movement is going to give us a ratio of the mobility of our molecule. So this is the typical experiment. The SDS treated protein samples with loading dye are loaded in the SDS page. These specific vessels or these specific, uh, this is called a well. So when, we, when it is set, we have a specific comb as it is called, which holds the protein molecules mixture in space, as you can see here. And the SDS treated protein samples with loaded dye are loaded onto the SDS page. Then we have this, all of this, since all of them are negatively charged, we would have a direction of migration of the protein samples. And based on the SDS page, after we stain the sample with Kumasi blue, a standard staining technique, we will have blue bands of where the proteins lie in our gel. Now, how do we determine the molecular weight from the electrophoresis? We run the protein sample on the SDS page along with standard molecular weight markers. We determine the relative mobility using the following formula where we have the migration of the protein from the lane and the migration of the tracking dye. Following that, we plot the log, log of the molecular mass versus the relative mobility of the standard sample that we have. We have a linear regression equation that determines the mass of the unknown protein. So when we are looking at a standard set, which we see here is in lane one, and we have their corresponding molecular weights marked here, and this is the unknown protein. So based on this, we can have a calibration curve, the log of the molecular weight along the y-axis, the relative migration along the x-axis, and based on the relative migration of the unknown protein given from the gel, we can find out the molecular weight of the protein of interest. Now, when we use SDS for this particular experiment in SDS page, there is one thing that we need to be concerned about is SDS denatures proteins. So if we have a multi-subunit protein, what will happen is these subunits will disintegrate into their relative monomeric units. Now, this disruption is going to be a cause for concern if we do not know our actual protein multi-subunit structure. So to separate the multi-subunit 
complex of the enzyme, we separate them upon charge, size, and the shape of the molecule. In this case, we can do that where we are using non-denaturing conditions. These non-denaturing conditions result from an understanding of the fact that we are not adding SDS to this particular gel. So when we are looking at SDS page versus native page, and we have five subunits belonging to this particular protein, and we run a native page that is without SDS and one with SDS, we will reach a case. So this is our, as we can see, the native page, which will give us the multimeric protein molecular weight because we have not added SDS page to this. However, when we add SDS page, as you can see here, we have the subunit molecular weights because the subunits are no longer in that multimeric form. The protein is no longer in its multimeric form. And we look at the different bands corresponding to the different five, the different subunits in this case, five of them that range in molecular weight from 25 to 45 kilodalton. So this is a typical method by which we can determine the molecular weights of proteins. And it is extensively used in protein chemistry laboratories to find out the molecular weight of proteins. An important factor, another experiment where we can also identify the PI of a protein, it depends upon the isoelectric point. We know that the isoelectric point depends critically on the presence of the amino acid side chains that can be protonated or deprotonated. So, depending on this, we need to know which are these particular amino acids that will have a charge at a specific pH. We know that we have aspartic acid, glutamic acid, lysine, and arginine. Lysine and arginine have positive charges. Aspartic acid and glutamic acid have negative charges. So depending upon the pH, if we have a low pH, if we reduce the pH, then we expect our molecule to be positively charged. This then leads to an interesting idea for the experiment that if we are looking at the pi of the protein, based on its particular charge, then if the pH is less than the pi of the protein, that is a low pH, the protein is positively charged. When the pH, pH is at the pi of the protein, there is no charge. And when the pH is greater than the pi of the protein, we have a negative charge. So now if we subject our protein of interest through a field, or through a gel that has what is called a specific strip, an ampullite strip, that looks at a pH stable gradient where we have the electrophoresis conducted through the stable pH gradient, the movement of the protein will occur as long as the protein has a charge to it. So as soon as the pH becomes equal to the pi, so we have a pH gradient. When the pi of the protein is equal to the pH, the protein will no longer move because it does not have a charge. It has zero charge. So in this case, the proteins will move through the gel until they reach the point in which the pH gradient is present, where the pH is equal to the pi as the protein is going to have a net negative charge at this particular point. So this is our strip, nampholite strip as it is called, that has a particular pH range. Now, this is our isoelectric focusing gel. And when we are looking at the movement through a specific, this is an SDS polyacrylamide slab. Now, what happens is our proteins will move in the direction of their particular charge depending upon their size in the SDS polyacrylamide gel and then according to their charge along the isoelectric focusing gel. 
So what happens here is the movement will continue. So we will have a spot that will correspond to the movement that will be stopped because of the pH being equal to the pi of the protein. And what will happen is we will have a specific direction of fluorosis of electrophoresis dependent on the molecular weight. So it is a combination of two techniques where we will be looking at a molecular weight difference as well as a PI or charge difference which will render the protein immovable in the gel. So any spot here where the protein does not move anymore depending upon the PI and the pH we will have that specific location of the protein. Another very commonly used technique is a microscopy. Microscopy is a very important tool for the high resolution imaging of protein molecules. For example, in many research labs around the world today, they look at cryo electron microscopy a very new method, a relatively new method to find out the structures of protein molecules. We will not go into the techniques of cryo-electron microscopy, but nevertheless, an understanding of how the molecule will behave under this field where we have the microscopic techniques that we can use. Now, what we are looking at here particularly, we, look, we can look at supramolecular assemblies of proteins in the cell or fibrils that are important components of disease. In this case, in electron microscopy, there are two major techniques, transmission electron microscopy and scanning electron microscopy. In these specific techniques, the difference lies in the preparation and there are special treatments by which we can define our uh, methodologies in this case, and the difference in resolution as well, because transmission electron microscopy in the method that it uses has higher resolution and is useful for multi subunit proteins. If we look at amyloid structures, a topic that we are going to cover when we study protein aggregation and protein protein interactions, we will look at a negative staining set and a metal shadowing where you can see a distinctive. Same systems, but because of the different conditions prior to the electron microscopic preparation, we have distinctive sets where we can actually see the different fibrils in the microscopic image. The different scale bars are important for the microscopic images as well because this tells us how long our fibers or fibrils are. If we look at probe microscopy, probe microscopy is a relatively newer method and it uses an ultra fine mechanical probe that runs across the molecule sample. Now, as it does so, it sees the conversion to, for, to an electrical signal and produces a pseudo 3D image. Techniques like this are atomic force microscopy and scan and scanning tunnel in microscopy. In atomic force microscopy, we have a cantilever arm that is attached to a piezoelectric crystal and we have our monolayer most, most preferably on the surface and we have a specific method where we will have the path of the cantilever follow a specific path and then when it hits upon a protein, it will give us an image in 3D in a profile. The pizza crystal converts pressure to voltage and has potential for very high resolution that will tell us or give us some information about the protein. If we look at the different AFM methods that are known, we have what is called the contact mode, the CAFM, where the tip makes physical contact with the sample. And as the tip is moved across the sample, the contact force causes the cantilever to bend because of the changes in the topography of the sample that is connected. In a non-contact mode, the cantilever is vibrated near the sample and we have another kind of detection possible. In the intermittent mode, 
we have a similar non-contact mode and we have it closer so it taps on the surface and in all cases the sample is carefully placed on usually a fresh cleaved mica surface for analysis. In the typical AMF equipment, the AFM equipment, what we have is we have a laser beam and we have a cantilever and this is the piezoelectric pistol. So as we have our scanning across the sample, we have the feedback of the XYZ controls here that gives us a scanned image of our specific sample. And based on this tapping mode, as it is called, where we can look at the tap image of our protein. So this, for example, is a picture of DNA, where we have an image of the double-stranded DNA molecules taken during the tapping mode that actually tells you the surface. It gives you some idea about the surface of the molecules and how the molecules can aggregate. Sometimes we have specific amyloid structures that are useful for identifying the presence of fibrils, the presence of smaller aggregates of proteins as well. In a specific problem that we will now look at, the question that has been asked here is what happens in an SVS page experiment with and without beta mercaptor ethanol for the protein structure shown. In this particular experiment, we see, or in this particular protein structure that we see, we see that there is a 60 kilodalton molecule uh, fragment or subunit, and we have a 30 kilodalton subunit. What happens here is if we have the specific gel electrophoresis run with and without beta mercaptor ethanol, that is the experiment that is going to be conducted. Now, what we have here is a specific idea based on how to do the experiment. This is the end of module four that looked at protein isolation and characterization. These are the references. Thank you.